Uh, well, I thought I would just talk uh, a little bit about my uh, previous two books to give some context, and then talk briefly about my, my current book, and then open it up to any questions you guys might have. Uh, and basically what I like to do is I like to really immerse myself in my topics, just dive right in and try to live them. So uh, my first book was uh, called The Know-It-All, and this was about reading the Encyclopedia Britannica from A to Z. And this one came about because I felt that my IQ was dropping about one point every year that I was out of college, and I felt something drastic needed to be done. So I, uh, I got the idea from my dad, who started to read the encyclopedia when I was a kid, but he only made it up to the middle of the letter B. Uh, so I didn't get very far. He was around Boomerang, and he was like, that's enough. And he, uh, he, I decided to finish what he began and restore the, our family's name, uh, you know, remove this black spot. So that's what I did. And uh, it was actually a much, much larger enterprise than I imagined. I mean, it is a, a long book. It's 44 million words and 33,000 pages. As I say in the book, if you stack up the, the volumes, it's about four foot eight. So it's a Danny DeVito of knowledge. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was incredibly difficult, but fascinating. And, uh, and I learned so much. and. Uh, and I actually became perhaps too enthusiastic with what I learned, so I wanted to share it with everyone. And my wife started to find me one dollar for every irrelevant, irrelevant fact that I inserted <laughs> into conversation. So she, it sounds like your wife has a similar problem. Uh, but, uh, and I, I picked up a tremendous amount of information, uh, much of which I've forgotten. But I have found that if you throw it up at the wall, some of it is going to stick. So I still have a lot in there. And unfortunately, I have a lot that I want to forget. That I, you know, I, I would be happy not to know that opossums have 13 nipples. You know, I, don't, I, I, won't, I would like to get that. I, I, you know, Rene Descartes had a fetish for cross-eyed women. That's in there forever. And I can't get it out. But I, uh, but in addition to that, I learned so much that uh, that changed my life for the better. And it really did turn out to be a life-affirming experience. And uh, I'll just give you two quick examples of how it, uh, it changed my life for the better. The first is that I thought that after reading the encyclopedia, I would never want to read another book. You know, that would be it. Uh, but actually it had the opposite effect. It really whetted my appetite and made me more curious and more eager to read uh, books. You know, I would read in the, in the letter W about Victoria Woodhull. She was just one of hundreds of amazing people. She was, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's a 19th century feminist, a pioneer of the feminism movement. She was the first woman to run for president. She was the first female stockbroker. And also, she was a renowned psychic, which I thought was an excellent combination. A psychic <laughs> stockbroker. <laughs> it wouldn't want that. Uh, and the second thing that, that, that uh, I wanted to mention was that after reading the encyclopedia, all the thousands of years of human history, I did come away more optimistic. Because you read about the highs and the lows, and the highs are incredibly high, and the lows are incredibly low. But uh, overall, I think that it became clear that progress is real. That we, as horrible as the 20th century was, and in, in parts of the 21st century, well, as horrible as it was, uh, compared to what, where we were 5,000, 10,000 years ago, we are so much better off. I mean. Uh, 10,000 years ago, the chances of being killed by another human being were, were uh, you know, three. Uh, the chances that you would be killed by another human being were one in three. And so this was, uh, even with the genocide of the world wars of 
of the 20th century, we, are, we have made amazing strides. So it made me more optimistic that we would you know, continue this. Uh, and I loved it, so I, I loved the experience. And I said, I want to do this again. Uh, and the only thing that I could, the only book that I, I thought will, would rival the encyclopedia in its impact was the Bible. So this was my second project, The Year of Living Biblically. And this one came about because I grew up with no religion at all. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So, <laughs> not there. Uh, but I, I became increasingly interested in religion, and I wanted to know what to teach my son, my young son. So I decided I'm going to learn about the Bible. And one way to learn about it was to live it, to really just try to follow what it said. So that's what I did. I wrote, I read the Bible, which I had never done, and I wrote down every rule that I could find in the Bible, every piece of advice. And this turned out to be a very long list, uh, hundreds of rules. And I wanted to follow them all without picking and choosing because I wanted to see how this would affect my life. So I, I wanted to follow the famous ones, like uh, the, Love Your Neighbor, uh, the Ten Commandments, and uh, Be Fruitful and Multiply. And by the way, I was fruitful and multiply during my biblical year. I had twin boys, so I, I take my uh, projects very seriously. Uh, but in addition to the famous ones, I wanted to follow the, the lesser-known rules, the uh, you know, the Bible says that you cannot shave the corners of your beard. And I didn't know where the corners were. So I just let the whole thing grow. And uh, by the end, I, I looked, you know, it was down to here. And I, I spent a lot of time at airport security. If I could to what I looked like. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, that you cannot wear clothes made of mixed fibers. And it seems so strange to me. Why? It's like micromanaging. Why would God care if I wore a poly cotton blend? But, uh, but I decided there's no way for me to know the meaning of this rule, if there is any meaning, unless I try it. So I got rid of my poly cotton clothes. Uh, the Bible says to uh, stone adulterers. So I thought I would give that a shot. Uh, and I'll just very briefly tell you, I was able to stone one adulterer. Uh, I was in Central Park, and I was wearing my biblical robes and sandals. Because at this point, this was later in the year, I was really trying to get into character. So I had on my, uh, on my outfit, and a man came up to me and said, why are you dressed like this? And I explained to him, I'm trying to follow the Bible from the Ten Commandments right on down to stoning adulterers. And he says, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And I said, well, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I, was, I was so excited for the altar. So I took out a handful of stones that I had been carrying around for this occasion. And, uh, and he actually, they were small stones. He grabbed them out of my hand and threw them at my face. So he was a very aggressive adulterer. And I felt it was uh, an eye for an eye. I could throw one back at him. So this was the way I stoned an adulterer. And it was an odd experience, uh, for sure. But it also allowed me to grapple with some of the big issues that I wanted to, to think about during this year, which included how can the Bible be so wise and compassionate and relevant in some parts and yet so seemingly barbaric in others, and talk about stoning adulterers and stoning homosexuals. So uh, I, I got to talk to people about this, really explore it, and, and that's what I loved about the year. It, it, it did change my life, even more than the encyclopedia book. I took away so many lessons that I have kept with me. Uh, I'll just give you one example, and, and that is, it really changed my, my views on gratitude. Because I was, during my year, the Bible says that you have to say prayers of thanksgiving. So I was saying these prayers of thanksgiving. And I was getting carried away. You know, I was saying prayers of thanksgiving for everything. You know, I'd press the elevator button, and I'd be thankful the elevator came. You know, I would get in the elevator, I'd be thankful that it didn't plummet to the basement. 
Uh, and it was a weird way to live, but but it was there was something wonderful about it because you start to realize there are hundreds of things that go right every day that we completely take for granted, and and we focus on the three or four that go wrong. So this was a radical shift, and it, I've tried to keep it. It's, it's hard. It's a battle because my mind does gravitate to the negative, but. Uh, but it, it, it's something that has changed my life in, in such a profound way. And after that, after the Bible experience, I realized this is, you know, it's a, this is kind of an interesting way to live, to try to do these experiments, and that they do improve your life. They, you know, they can be a pain in the butt, but they're fascinating, and they improve your life, and and it's a great way to get out of your rut. Uh, so I decided that I would try to write an entire book where I would write uh, about several different experiments that I would try on my life. So that is the new book, The Guinea Pig Diaries. It's a series of these experiments that I did on myself to try to make my life better. And I'll just talk about uh, three and then open it up to any questions that you might have. Um, the first, uh, one of the first ones that I did was a, uh, an experiment uh, called My Outsourced Life. And for this one, I hired a team of people in Bangalore, India, to do everything for me. So uh, they, they answered my email, and they answered my phone. Uh, they argued with my wife for me. They, uh, they read bedtime stories to my son. Uh, so this is the greatest month of my life because I just sat back and read books and watched, you know, watched movies. And they were actually better at arguing with my wife than I was. So <laughs> it turned out that it was it was a vast improvement. Um, that was so. This was one of the greatest months. On the other end of the spectrum was a uh, an experiment I did uh, about a movement called radical honesty. And this is a movement started by a psychologist in Virginia. And he believes that you should never lie, ever. But more than that, whatever's on your brain should come out of your mouth. With no, there should be no filter. So I tried this for a month. This is the worst month of my life. This I do not recommend. This is basically the invention of lying. There's a new movie, uh, you know, but this is sort of the real life version of it. And uh, it was horrible, you know. I was, uh, I'd be in a restaurant, and uh, we'd run into some old friends of my wife's, and uh, and they would say, "Oh, we should all get together." And I would have to say what was on my mind, which is, "No thanks, you know, I uh, you seem nice, but I have no interest in seeing you again." And uh, they would shockingly be uh, offended. And, uh, they walked out, and my wife was furious. So it definitely has some huge downsides right there. But it was also, I will say, in fairness, there are things about radical honesty that are great. And uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly liberating. You don't have to try to remember the lies that you told. It was interesting to see how much energy I spent every day on trying to remember what I told different people. I, uh, I also, uh, believe that, that we, we can practice something I call sustainable radical honesty. So I don't think we should all be radically honest or we have no man. The guy who founded it, by the way, has been married five times. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you need it in marriage, you need it in business, you need some lies, but we can all be a lot more honest. Uh, I mean, one thing is that we can be radically, positively honest. This was one thing he, he, the psychologist talks about. You know, it doesn't have to be brutal honesty. It can be. During this month, I called up one of my first editors at a tiny newspaper in California and told him how much his mentorship meant to me. And he thought, you know, he was a little freaked out, but it was, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was very uh, touching, and I think he appreciated it in the end. And uh, so I do think we can be more more open in that way. Uh, uh, and, and one I'll just mention very quickly is uh, relates to Tom's work. Uh, 
I, I tried to do something, uh, another experiment where I refused to multitask for a month, or at least tried. I failed. I, I multitask all the time, but I tried to be a unitasker. But I only did one thing at a time. And this came about because of driving. I was multitasking while I was driving. I was listening to Al the Albert Einstein biography by Walter Isaacson. A wonderful thing. Uh, so I was listening to an audio, you know, book on tape. And uh, I was so interested in it, I kind of forgot about the road. And I, I jumped the highway median into oncoming traffic. And no one was hurt, thank God. But uh, it, it really gave me a sense that multitasking really is incredibly dangerous. So um, and now I'm not allowed to drive. My wife needs to sit in the back with the kids. But, uh, but I, I also love this month of multitasking because it also changed the way my brain was wired. I don't think that we realize how much multitasking has affected the way we think. Um, and and uh, so this was an amazing uh, a month for me. Uh, I'll, I'll just end by telling you the, uh, the final experiment in the book, which is actually suggested by readers. Uh, readers who have read my first two books send me suggestions on things I should do, which I love. Uh, a lot of them, by the way, send, tell me that I should do all the positions in the Kama Sutra, which, uh, which my wife, Julie, put the kibosh on that one. <laughs> it's okay by me, actually, because I think it would be, yeah, I'm not limber enough. <laughs> but, uh, but one of them they suggested was that I follow my wife's every command for the entire month. Uh, and, uh, they came up with the title, Whip. That was the idea. And, uh, and I should do this because I have put her through quite a bit. Uh, you know, she is quite patient. To give you, uh, during the Bible year, uh, the Bible says that you cannot, you cannot touch women to, while they're menstruating. But if you take it really literally, Leviticus says that you cannot sit on a seat where a menstruating woman has sat because then the seat is impure. So my wife found that offensive. And she sat in every seat in our home. <laughs> <laughs> she was in her room and home. So I had to stand. So. <laughs> but anyway, this last one was about following her every time. And it was, a, you know, it was, it was horrible. You know, she got drunk with power. You know, she was, uh, you know, we'd be watching TV and she'd be on the couch. She'd say, uh, can you change the channel? And I'd say, sure. But you have the remote control right there. And she, she would say, well, yeah, I know, but I want you to get up. <laughs> well, that's the kind of thing that I was dealing with. Uh, but overall, it was an amazing month, and eye-opening. Uh, I mean, it was, she, we, when we wrote down all of the things we do around the house, it was really kind of shocking. You know, I thought, for instance, those liquid soap dispensers, I thought they just refilled by themselves. <laughs> I, I thought they were self-filling, but apparently not. Uh, and now I have to do them. So it, it has definitely changed the work of the... And, and reading about the statistics on marriage, it really is shocking that we still have this 19th century structure for the division of labor within a marriage, even though uh, in so many families we have both spouses working full-time. And even in families where both spouses work full-time, the women are still doing, on average, two and a half times the housework and five times the child care. So, uh, you know, I unfortunately, for my life, have now, uh, you know, I'm trying to get to 50-50. I think it's, it's horrible for my life, but it's great for our marriage. So, you know, we got to balance those things. And, so I loved doing all these experiments, and they all did change my life for the better in some way. And uh, I'll just end with a quote that, uh, that I, I, I'm sort of in the middle of a book tour right now. And, and at the very first signing, a woman asked sent me to write this quote from my first book, which I actually didn't come up with, so I can't take credit for it. But it was a quote by Ian Fleming. And who wrote the James Bond novels, but he also wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And his quote was that you, 
you should never say no to adventure. Otherwise, you'll lead a very dull life. And that, I thought, was such a beautiful sentiment uh, and, and so captured my philosophy of life that I thought I would end with that. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.
Yes, uh, back to radical honesty. Uh, the uh, psychologist, he was also a politician, right? That is true. And yes. he actually won in the primary, and then he lost in the general election because of his radical honesty, because in addition to having five wives, he was also quite open with his sexual proclivities and was a bisexual, and when he announced this to his constituents, that's when things kind of imploded out of him. <laughs> that's it. Had you read about him before? Uh, he was featured in uh, this, this American Life, one of the segments they did. Uh, right. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. And it was really quite amusing. <laughs> yeah, he was amazing. Brad Blanton is his name, and, and he did run, he's incredible, you know, he's very far to the left, and he ran for Congress in Virginia. And the first time he ran, he got 25% of the vote, uh, because the only campaign he did was a, a five-minute infomercial about how, uh, how, you know, how horrible government was, and he was going to be the only politician to tell the truth all the time. Uh, so that was the first time he did great. Then he ran again, and he decided this time he was going to talk more and go out and meet the constituents. And when they met him, when they started trying to get to know him, and he started insulting them, and uh, <laughs> talking about his, uh, his weird workshops that he holds, that's when the 25% shrunk to like, you know, 0.5%. So, uh, yeah, sometimes it's better, less is more. Well, sometimes I didn't have time to explain because, you know, there's no filter. So by the time I got around to explaining, it was too late. But yeah, there was certainly quite a bit of, uh, of reparations to be done. There were lots of apology notes and letters. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I mean, one of the problems is that, uh, you know, men, as you might have read in, in Cosmopolitan, men do think about sex quite a bit. So if you are being radical, I'll put it this way, there's a fine line between radical honesty and creepiness. And, uh, unfortunately, I kind of crossed that line a couple of times. So, so my word, there's so many apologies to be made. So, yeah. Doctor, uh, the more sex you have, the longer you live. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That was actually, I had, yeah, Dr. Oz, Dr. Oz is sort of on Oprah. Now he has his own show. He says that you should have sex every day. And again, uh, my wife put the kibosh on my <laughs> Two and 
I am rule number 11. It was so important that you wanted to appeal to this problem. So, uh, but anyway, but I love doing that because I learned a lot about, you know, civility. And, uh, and just a couple of weeks ago, there was a whole news cycle about the breakdown in civility with uh, uh, Kanye West and Joe Wilson, you know, just, you know, they were being radically honest, by the way. They were, <laughs> they were on, uh, you know, uh, they were Brand Blanton's uh, followers. But anyway, I, it was an amazing, I loved that month, and that definitely changed the way I acted. Uh, one more, like that good? Anyone else? Yeah, Jackie right here. Oh, well, the health one. The, uh, oh, not for that model, but um, yeah, the health one will be my next one. So, uh, but I did, I guess there, I have done a couple of experiments since then. Uh, one, the most recent was in Esquire magazine, and it was called, Do I Love My Wife? An Investigative Report. And, uh, <laughs> and I went inside an MRI, a functional MRI machine, where they take movies of your brain as they showed me pictures of my wife, and I had to think about my wife, and and then also as they showed me pictures of Angelina Jolie, so <laughs> started to see the difference there, and uh, it was very interesting. I do love my wife, it turns out, 66 <laughs> percent. After 10 years of marriage, not good. So I feel pretty good at that. <laughs> well, the idea of these functional MRIs is that, like, you know, they will, they're like uh, x-rays into your, your brain, you know, they will tell you the truth that even you don't know. Uh, so that, uh, they're, they're really fascinating and kind of scary, and I don't think they're, they're totally accurate yet, but I think they're going to get more and more accurate. So I think, uh, I mean, I actually think it would have been more useful if I were a single man, and I was deciding between two women, you know, going into the MRI machine. They really, really thought about these women. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but, but I'll leave that to someone else. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh